Well, good morning. You might have thought that John was sharing with us when you heard Pastor Gerton, but I'm John's dad. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard, and uh, if you don't know me, I was the pastor here for 35 years, and I was the founding pastor, and they kind of pulled me out of retirement today to speak. And the reason for that is, is that we've been hearing messages on solitude and silence and simplicity spiritual disciplines, and they're all just great things, wonderful things that people have been doing in, in Christ and in the, in the world for a long period of time because they help us so much spiritually as we grow together. And so all three of the pastors this week decided that they were going to put that into practice, and they all went on vacation. <laughs> they left town, and so that left me. And so they asked if, or Chris, Pastor Chris asked if I would share with you this morning. You know, and, and I appreciate our pastors very much, and they are now my pastor. And I hope you do too. They bring us great messages. They bring us challenging messages. They serve in so many ways. And I just was thinking maybe we should put our hands together and thank God for them and for their leadership. I began my ministry or my walk with the Lord 48 years ago, come this fall or this December. I've been walking with the Lord for 35 years of those 48 years I pastored this church here. And uh, we came here, my wife and I, and uh, there, none of this was here, believe me. And uh, it was just a small little room over there. And some of you were here and some of you walked that journey with me. Some of you don't even know me. You've never even heard me speak before but you're here this morning, and my prayer is, is that the Holy Spirit will speak to all of us here this morning and uh, into our hearts and into our lives. So I'm just going to ask that you would just join me in prayer. Father, thank you for what you've blessed us with. Lord, for the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, that you are a God of grace and mercy, that your love overflows and we cannot comprehend it. But Lord, we come to you this morning realizing that, Lord, life is a struggle. And Lord, walking with you can be a struggle as well. And I would ask, Father, that you would use this man right here, just to share what your thoughts are, to share your words, and those who hear them, that they would take them in, that as Jesus challenged us, when he said, if you have ears, let, let them hear. Those who have ears, let them hear. And Lord, that your spirit would revive and strengthen us this day in our battle, and in our walk, as we walk with you, in Jesus' name, amen. So as we've heard these messages on silence, and solitude, and, and Sabbath, and simplicity, and slowing down, and all these things, I want to ask you a question. I wonder how many of us have put them into practice. You know, why is it that we hear messages maybe on Sunday morning, we say, that's right, that's right, we walk out the door and we forget it, you know? Or we read something in the scripture and all of a sudden it's gone and we find ourselves in the same position that we were in before. So I want to bring you, as it says on the screen here, a message today about the battleground that we are in as Christians and what I'm referring to is not the cultural battles. I'm not talking about the political battles. I'm not talking about what happens out in Oregon or what happens in the Mideast. I'm talking about a very personal battle that whether you realize it or not that you are in, I am in. It is a battle that is constantly before us and a battle that we all struggle with. I want to talk to you about the disciples' battleground and uh, share with you some passages of Scripture this morning, a number of passages of Scripture, actually. 
And when, you know, we hear that word battle, what we hear, what, what does it bring? What does it conjure up in our mind? It conjures up like a struggle, like we're in a wrestling match, or that maybe there's a war even going on around us or in us as we go through life. Now, Paul openly admitted that he has the same battle that you and I have. And I want to read the passage of Scripture where Paul said this in Romans chapter 7, and uh, verses, picking it up in verse 14. He says this, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. And what's he saying? I don't understand what, what I'm doing here. He says, For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now we can listen to what Paul is saying here, and it sounds really complicated. You know, I do this, I don't do this, I don't understand why I'm doing this, but yet I still do it, and I don't like it, it's evil, but I still struggle. And Paul is really, what he is saying here, he kind of, if we were to look at it, he's acknowledging that here is Paul, this great man of God, this great missionary, this man that God used greatly. And he's been walking with the Lord for some time now. And he says, I still battle myself. And I want to talk to you this morning about, it. he acknowledges, I should say, his battle. And what he says there, again in Romans seven fifteen, he says, for I do not understand my actions For I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. You ever been like Paul? You ever feel that way? I know I shouldn't do it. It keeps slipping out. keeps coming up. I keep getting angry. I keep getting mad. I keep having lustful thoughts. I keep having this or that. Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. Many times. Many times. Many times. I just can't defeat that thing in my life. And it keeps coming around in my life. He said in Romans 7, 21, in that passage we read, he said, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, I want to do it right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, But I see in my members another law, and look what it's doing, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And so Paul is simply saying, I want to do the right thing, but I keep tripping up. I keep having this struggle in life. And so Paul is saying, when he uses the word waging war, he's saying there's a battle going on. And you know there's a battle that goes on in me. And there's a battle that goes on in you. Will I do the things 
God wants me to do? Or is my mind fixed on other things and I'm going to do those? Or what causes my mind to be fixed on those things? When the scripture uses the word mind, and it's kind of interesting to look at it because if you've ever read the New Testament, you will find that the word mind is constantly through it. There's over 30 some references in the translated New Testament to the mind, to the mind. And I want to talk to you this morning about the battleground of our mind and the battle that goes on there. So Paul says this, this happens. And it's interesting in the scripture that it uses a number, if you went back to the Greek, different words to describe the mind, but we translate it into the mind. So this is where this battleground happens, the center of our understanding. It is a place where God has given us this inner being and a free will. I can do what I want to do. God does not take that away from us. And so with that, who am I serving in my life? Paul wrote in Romans 8, 5 through 6, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. And in the scripture, death doesn't mean we bodily die a lot of times. It means that we're separated from life. And the source of life is God himself. And then when I put my mind on the things of the flesh and what it desires, it separates me from what God wants me to be. But he said, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And what he's talking about when he says set, he's talking about where our moral interest is. Am I interested in doing the very things of God? Or am I more interested in doing the things that my body craves? My body is after in life. And we all know the temptations that come upon us in the flesh. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of of their minds and wait a minute why would Paul say that he was writing to Christians followers of Christ and he was saying to them you must no longer do as those who aren't followers of Christ do and if we think about it what he's saying is you can still do it if you want to do it but you shouldn't do it and we face that battle today as well and he says in the futility of their minds what did he mean the futility of our minds well he kind of defines it he says they are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorances that is in them due to the hardness of their of heart they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality greedy to the practice every kind of impurity but that is not the way you learn Christ. And it's an exclamation point. He's saying, that's not the way you learn Christ. He goes on to say, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self, which belongs to our, your former manner of life and corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds your inner being, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Now, Paul wasn't the only one who talked about this. So did Peter, and so did John. And Peter said this. He says, therefore, preparing your what? Your minds for action. It is the inner side of us, the inner being of us that is prepared. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. 
He's saying the same thing Paul said. Don't be conformed. Don't go after the things that you went after before you came to Christ. Don't go after what the unbeliever goes after. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. You shall be separated as I am separated. You shall not enter into those things that others do, because this is not my way, says the Lord. Now, most of the Old New Testament, when you read the New Testament, you know what it's appealing to? Your mind. It's telling you to make the right choices, to think the right way. It's helping us think the right way. I don't know if you've ever thought about the New Testament that way, but that's what it's written to. It's written to this inner side of us, what's controlling us, the inner being. And it, it, the place where we understand, where we make, decide our actions are going to be our intellect, our insight, where the will is. The battleground is in our mind. It's the mind, that control center that we have. You know, it's kind of interesting in our society today when an enemy wants to attack and hold somebody ransom or a company ransom, what do they do? We've seen it all over now from Russia, from China, from our own country. They come into companies like the uh, oil company out east the Colonial Pipeline or JBS Beef, what do they do? They don't have to come in and take their trucks and shut their trucks down or anything. They find a weakness in their system and they put a ransomware in there or a virus. And it doesn't even have to be big companies. There have been people right in our own community that that's happened to. And they capture them. And they really hold them captive. And in the case of that pipeline out there, it was not only the company, it was everybody along the East Coast as well. They worm their way in. You know, that's what Satan does. He looks for our weaknesses. He looks for mine. He hears the things I say, the things I do, those things I'm prone to, and he makes them available. Because he wants to hold me captive in life. And so when Satan and his kingdom, they're the kingdoms of darkness. And they want to tempt us. And when I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, I have this battleground that is set up inside of me then. Because my flesh is yet to be redeemed. And so we have this battleground that is in our mind. And so in one corner, like if we were in a ring, a boxing ring or something, you would find in one corner the, the, the darkness in death, in life. And what we would find is our flesh, because our flesh is yet redeemed. Our flesh is not, our flesh is corruptible, the scripture tells us. Our flesh desires things, it wants things, it wants to taste things, it wants to be fed with so many things that God says might not be good for us or are not good for us. Paul says this, well, it, and, and it's our fallen part of our nature, the flesh desires. But in that corner, in that flesh, in the things you're going after and you might be thinking about, is somebody behind it. He's kind of like the coach. He's kind of like the, the one in the, in the corner with us. And it's Satan himself and his kingdom and his demons. And, sec and then they come across to us as, oh, it's just right. Just do it. It just makes you feel good. You know, and that's the flesh that's feeling good. And he, he appears to us and it's, it's, it's all good. You know, and in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen through 15, the apostle wrote this. He said, and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness and their end will correspond to their deeds. And what's he saying? Well, it looks good. It tastes good. 
It seems like the right thing to do. It makes me feel good. And that's the flesh feeling that way. You see, Satan likes to tempt us. We like power. We like position. We like um, money. We like all of these things. And what he tries to do is create, like he did with Eve in the garden in Adam, a dissatisfaction in us, a dissatisfaction, and then he offers the solution. See, because Eve and Adam, they were perfectly happy until Satan came along and suddenly said to them, you know, hey, look what you don't have. I can offer you this. And we find that in life as we go through life. And he does it in a very subtle, sneaky way. He'll do it over generations to families. I've seen it where families give in a little here. The next generation gives in a little here. And one of the sayings I've shared with you over the years, the church is that the moderations where the parents start to moderate becomes the excesses in their children. They're going to take it a little further every generation unless something happens within them. And this battle goes on and there's another source in that corner of dark and death. And it is our world or our society around us. It is just something that Satan uses. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And John tells us that we're not supposed to be in love with the world. He says this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh oh. And then he says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. It is there to draw us away from God. And so we have this, this battle that goes on. You know, before we come to salvation, before we receive Christ, and maybe you've never received Christ, you don't have this battle. Because the Holy Spirit is not living in you, which you battle against. Because Satan has blinded your eyes and you don't see the need for God. And you could be sitting here today, you could be listening on the, on the internet or whatever, and you say, oh, that doesn't make any sense, I don't see any need for God. And you know something, you ought to be really upset. Because Satan has blinded your need for God. It says in Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, he says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds, their minds, of, of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God. Satan has blinded them. They can't see it in life. But when we put our faith and our trust in God, God puts his spirit in us. And we have this battle then that starts to, to rage inside of us. And we go, all of a sudden, light and life come into us. And uh, we begin, I call it the resurrected corner, because it is where life has come into us. It's the, the spirit of God is there in us. And the spirit of God is the coach that we have. He is the one who wants to direct us. He's the one who wants to help us. He is the divine power in our life. And he comes and we accept Jesus Christ. He's God himself. He's greater than Satan. He is the one who can defeat him in our personal life. He cries out that we would follow the ways of God. He empowers. He enlightens. He guides. And the Holy Spirit also helps us in, this, in the fact that he has what helps the Holy Spirit is that God has given us something else. He's given us his holy scripture. It's like the training manual, how we train, how we fight the fight, what we should follow, what we should do, and we need to know it. We need to take it in. We need to follow it in life, not ignore it, not put it aside, not let it collect dust, not just to say, oh yeah, that's just that preacher talking again. 
God gave it to help us to live the victorious life. And that's why it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching us, for reproof. And that means when we do wrong, he says, you're doing wrong. And then for correction, getting us back on the track and for training us in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He's given it to us so that we can win the battle in us. But it doesn't do us any good if we set it aside or we don't pay any attention to it. And then really, we can read it, which is good. I encourage you to read the Word of God. But if you want to go deeper, you study it. And as you study it, you can go into the third, and that's meditate on it. And if you want to be happy, the Psalm number one tells us, blessed, happy is the person who meditates on God's law. And that means you just take it and think about it. Dwell on it in life. Let it become the consuming thing in you and put it in to practice. And the other thing God has given us is prayer. This is how we can communicate to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the mighty God, the mighty one. We can communicate with him. We can praise him. We can give thanks to him. We can draw near to him. And Paul says in Ephesians six eighteen, praying at all times in the spirit. God has blessed us with this. But which side of us, if I have this in me, which side wins? And you know which side wins? When I look at these two together, whichever one I set my mind on. You see, because I can set my mind on all these things most of the time. And you know what wins? The dark side. Or I can set my mind and fill it up through scripture memorization, listen to Christian songs, listen to the things of God, and my mind is over here on this side, and it wins in my life. And so this isn't some kind of game we're playing. This is life and death that is involved here for us. And where I set my mind is how I live my life. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war against, according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought captive to obey Christ. And the thoughts of Christ are counter-cultural to much of what the world teaches us today and that teaches us how we should live and what we should do. He teaches us to live a different kind of life, the separated kind of life. And the more we fill and set our mind on the things of God through the Scripture, through even Christian music, through prayer and praise and thanksgiving, the more we walk empowered by the Holy Spirit to defeat the things of Satan in our life and the less the flesh is gratified. That's what Paul meant when he said this. He said, but I say walk by the Spirit and you're not going to gratify the desires of the flesh. And here's what I found in life. I can try and try and try and in my own self, I am never going to defeat him the desires of the flesh. It just isn't going to happen. It might be momentary, but I'm not. It is only when I surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit and allow God to work in my life that that's when victory is had in life. How we walk or live, it's determined in that battlefield. What I set my mind on, what I want to be consumed with, what I want to surrender to two. It's the inner person. Paul David Tripp said this. He said, the battle is not fought in our behavior, but our mind. You see, what, how we behave is first reconciled in our mind. Jesus said, it's not 
what comes out of a man that defiles a man. No, it's what comes in. But I got that backwards. I got that backwards, yeah. I got that backwards. But what Jesus is saying is, it's the inner person. What we have in our mind that we have to put out. O.S. Hawkins in the Joshua Code said, being, being comes before doing. For what we do is determined by who we are or, in the believer's case, whose we are. Am I sold out to Christ? Do, is he in control of my life? So who controls my personal battleground? Who controls it? Who controls your battleground? The answer is you do. It's where you think what you think about, what you set your mind on, what choice you make. And that's where victory is for us. It is a, where we, victory is found because victory is found in surrender to the ways of God. And God defeats the other in our life. If we pursue him, surrender to him, not just once, not just at salvation, every day, sometimes many times during the day. It's this constant surrender we have in life. Ever since I accepted Christ 48 years ago, I've realized, on a, as I grew in Christ, this is a battle I'm constantly in. I'm nev it's never going to be over in my life. Not until I go home to be with the Lord. Because I still have the flesh that always wants the other. It gravitates to it in life. So it's a process of growing. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Think differently. Let it happen. Become more and more like him in life that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and is what is his perfect will for us. And the question is, do I want to know it for me? You want to know it for you. What is that perfect will for me and the way that I should live? Do I want to win the battle? Now I want to give you a scripture to go home and read. If you want to read about this more. And it's Colossians 3, 1 through 17. You know, when our pastors challenge us to do certain things, do we do them? See, it's what I want to set my mind on. Well, do I really want to mind that? Or am I just going to get consumed with, let's go out to lunch, let's do this, let's do that, you know? Or will I do it? And that passage of Scripture starts out this way. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Or it starts out and says, if then you have been raised with Christ, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. And he goes on and he makes two lists there in that passage. One is the things of the earth. That's a partial list. And then a partial list of what we should be putting our faith in, our trust in. God wants the best for us. He loves us. And he wants to see his church in its best. So often today we see the church dwindling, losing its influence. And you know what we do to gain people to be more influential? We try to be more like the world. Instead of more like God, more separated, more holy. And we just want to blend in. And people think, well, why would I want to give up my time and do the things of God? I mean, you're just like me. You live like me. And I want to close with this illustration. Let's say this piano, big and heavy as it is, is God immovable, can't be moved. 
He is perfect in all of his ways. That's God. And I ask, and I look at this God, and I receive him as my Savior and Lord. And I'm going to say appropriately that this television is the fallen world right here. I mean, it just is tempting us, the Satan, you know, all these things. And we see pictures and things we should never see. And it's just, just full of all kinds of stuff. And so here it is. You know, I, I'm right here with it. You know, and all of a sudden I receive Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I'm saying, oh, I, I want to be different. I want to be like God. I want to be more like him. And, and so I start looking to God for things. But over time, a lot of times, I keep, my eyes keep drifting back to the world over here. And then I justify what, the way I'm living. And I say, you know what? I'm not part of this. I'm separated from the world. I'm separated from the world. And, you know, and there's God. And I, I'm doing okay because I'm never going to be perfect. But here's what happens in your life, and it's happened in my life. The world keeps moving further from God. Society keeps moving further from God. And I have my eyes fixed on society, and I keep saying, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm still separated from the world. But what's happening with my relationship with God? The gap is getting bigger because I have my eyes fixed on this and I'm okay. I'm okay because I'm not part of that. And I'm getting further from the source of life and the source of light. And the church, and the church, by the way, is me. The church is you. We often want to say the church and blame the pastor or something or some person out there. It's us. We're the, the body. We need to start getting back and being what God called us to be in life. And that's where we'll find happiness and joy in the way that we live. So I don't know where you're at in life. Are you closer to God or closer to the world? What brings you joy? What brings you happiness? What attracts you in life? Where's your mind fixed most of the time if you had a gauge in you? Would the mind always be over on here? And occasionally it bounces over here. What do you really want? Do you want to be godly? What do you want to set your mind on? The way it changes is we repent, we surrender. I am going to do the things of the Spirit of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do the things I've been hearing here, right here in this church. Spend more time alone with God. Be more silent. Slow down. Practice Sabbath. Do the things where I make time for God in my life and focus on Him. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us what we need in life. It is all there. You haven't held anything back from us for us to live victoriously. You, Lord, have given us your spirit. What more could you give us than the very spirit of God in us? You in us, Lord. You've given us your word, Lord, to train and to teach and to correct us, God, and so many things. Forgive us, God, if we don't pick it up and we don't study it and we don't read it, we don't meditate on it. Help us, God, to do it more and more. And Lord, you've given us access to you through prayer, your presence. Lord, may we be drawn to you, to love you, to learn that, Lord, prayer is more than a list of requests. It's presence with you. And all the things that we are blessed in your presence with. Help us, God, to be a people who love you deeply. And I pray, God, for that person that might be listening today. 
that, Lord, we all pray for that person who might be here today, that Satan has blinded their eyes, put a veil over them, and they can't see their need for you. I pray, God, that they would pull the veil back and look to you. I pray, Lord, that right now they would say, Lord, I turn my life back to you. I turn it over to you. Forgive me, God, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I want to be a new person in you and run hard after you the rest of my life. So I thank you, God, for that, that we can still come to you. And I pray, God, for that person, the Lord, that they, Lord, would begin that journey in Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord, where we can gather and remind ourselves of your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen.